It's Freedom Files with James Burns on American Freedom Radio. Embarking on the second hour, you're listening to Freedom Files live on this Tuesday afternoon, July 26, 2011. I am James Burns, your host, along with Adam, my network producer, man in the helm back at AFRHQ in Austin, Texas. I am coming at you live from Shreveport, Louisiana, and we're honored to be joined this afternoon by Popeye over at FederalJack.com. Not only does he post some great articles and some great videos, he's also a radio talk show host in his own right. He does a show called Down the Rabbit Hole which you can check out at Orion. Popeye, welcome to the show. How's it going, James? Um, you know, same thing every day. It just, it just seems to get more crazy with each passing day. It's like we're living in, uh, you know, some dystopian novel, some science fiction movie that I, I you know, grew up watching in the, the late 70s, early 80s, and it's all becoming a reality now. It's really weird. I know. I mean, it's just funny how a lot of this science fiction novels and movies tend to be becoming reality fiction becomes fact when you give it enough time it's almost like well that kind of makes you wonder if they were trying to tell us something and we just weren't paying attention at the time yeah and and that's something we're going to talk about today you know the programming that we get from tv shows and movies and even video games uh but first i'd like to talk about yourself you know popeye what what got you involved in in all this what woke you up to the the real world and lifted the veil for you and got you motivated to uh do such a, a great site like federaljack.com and even your own radio show. Well, I, uh, I woke up back in uh, 2006, and I already knew that I couldn't trust the government. I mean, the bumper sticker that Ron Paul has on his desk, it says, uh, don't steal, the government hates competition. <laughs> I had that on, like, my first truck when I was 17 <laughs> years old, and I lived in New Jersey, okay? I always had that attitude. I never trusted the government. And uh, after I was a volunteer firefighter for six years, uh, I helped out on 9-11 right in Jersey, right across the, the water there. And uh, I helped out the Red Cross. I did 12-hour shifts uh, loading up trucks and driving them to Ground Zero and stuff like that. Um, and 9-11, you know, to me, it was very personal because I was very close. And I was a little more personally involved in sitting in, you know, my living room watching on TV happen. And uh, – Long story short, I, I after that I joined the military. You know, I I served, and I didn't really start to pay attention to how we were treated as soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines until I got hurt, and I I went from being golden boy to dirtbag, and then I I saw how quickly you get treated. You know how quickly you do a one eighty, and I was like, wow, that kind of disillusioned me with the military a little bit and it, it made me snap back to my original thoughts of wow you know my original thoughts about the military before 9-11 were correct you know and about the government you know blah 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 blah. you can't trust them they treat you like crap and then just because i always liked uh mysterious stuff and ufos and ghosts and stuff like that from the time i was a little kid i had heard and researched somewhat about the new world order but you know after 9-11 that kind of that that stuff i kind of put it on the back burner i didn't even think about it and uh, while I was recovering from one of my surgeries, I uh, stumbled upon Behold a Pale Horse by William Cooper, and that was it. That uh, kind that's of, a great book. Yeah, it kind of set the tone. And it really screwed with my programming, too, in my head because I would get headaches when I was reading a book. And it didn't occur to me until years later what was happening. The headaches were, you know, I was reading this book, and this was knowledge that my brain was sucking in, and it was conflicting with the programming that I had in my head, and that's literally what was happening to me. And it took me a little while. I mean, I didn't read his book and be like, oh, my God. You know, I, I researched it, and then uh, my mother got sick, so I kind of got sidetracked, and she passed away from lung cancer. And after I, I dealt with that and everything, uh, I, and I had gotten out of the military, I started to read books written by generals and stuff uh, and guys that were on the ground in Iraq and everything, and I started to see how they micromanage the war and that it could have, you know, you have generals telling you that Iraq could have gone faster if they had just had the equipment and men that they, they said that they needed originally and everything else. And then that led me just into the whole, once I started to investigate the Iraq war further, I, you know, I realized, wow, you know, I remembered, well, yeah, I, I, you know, they used 9-11 as an excuse, this and that. And then I, 
I stumbled upon the movie Zeitgeist one night, and I'm not saying Zeitgeist is the greatest of all films, but it, <laughs> I, the, the second and third part in particular really had me like glued to the screen to the point where I had to go back and watch them again that same night. I was up for like five hours, and I just couldn't believe it. You know, and I was like so angry that this had happened and I hadn't realized what was going on. Like to me, it was right. The evidence was right there in front of your face. And it's like, oh, my God. So the more and more I researched it, the more and more I realized that I was wrong about this. You know, and I had originally denied that I, I, in my head, I was like, there's no way that they would. You know, our government screwed up, but they come on. They wouldn't, you know, eh, they wouldn't let it go that far. Like I agreed that Flight 93 had been, at least in my eyes, it had been shot down. You know, because we had heard local radio reports that they had shot Flight 93 down, and then it came out on TV that, you know, a plane had crashed in Pennsylvania and everything. So uh, we, I always knew the story wasn't accurate, but in my head, I was still, come on, you know, I was one of those people. And the more and more I researched it, I was like, wow, I was an idiot. And I first I had to deal with that. I had to get over my own ego. <laughs> and that's, that's probably one of the biggest things is people need to get over their own egos to be able to accept the information that's really out there. I definitely accept the fact that I was an idiot a long time ago. You know, when I was younger and dumber back, because, you know, 9-11 happened when I was, what, I think 20. And, you know, then I was a hardcore Republican. I was a Bush supporter. I thought the Republicans were good. The Democrats were bad. So, like everybody else, when 9-11 happened, you know, I was rallying behind the president and all this stuff. And I thought that it was a, you know, we had to go to war. We had to go to Afghanistan and Iraq. But then... I started making some friends because I was in, you know, corporate radio at the time. I was interning there and part-timing, and I became a DJ. And I made some really good friends that were awake to a lot of this stuff already. They read Bill Cooper. They, they knew that there was, there's more going on than just the BS that you see on the mainstream media. And much like you, when you were first reading the book, I had that same problem with his book. And I also had that same problem with what people were telling me. Look, they're both bad. The Republicans and Democrats, they're both screwing you over. I'm like, no, no, no way, no way. Because I was a big Rush Limbaugh and Handy fan. And then everything started sinking in. I mean, the moment whenever it all came out that there was no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq when Saddam Hussein had no ties to al-Qaeda or Osama bin Laden, the boogeyman, and he wasn't even an extremist. He was a secular Muslim. And that started laying the first seeds of doubt. And then the, 20, the 2004 presidential election, you know, that kind of was the, the big eye-opener. The moment you, you had these two candidates, W and Kerry. You know, they both were... They both went to Yale. They both were skull and bonesmen, both wealthy, both cousins. What are the odds? Yeah. What are the odds exactly? It, 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 for people to think that this stuff happens by coincidence and happenstance, come on. You know, coincidence may – I don't really particularly believe in coincidence personally myself. But, okay, maybe once is a coincidence. But two, three, four times, that's a pattern. That's how you analyze stuff. I mean, that's how any investigator would analyze stuff. You know, would the if if you and I did something together, right? You and I colluded, conspired to do something because that is the definition of a conspiracy, James. After all, two or more people getting together to do a bad thing. So if you and I colluded to do something evil, you know, and we got together and we decided yeah. and we said we're going to uh, rob a bank, just yeah. you know, that that's conspiracy. That that is a conspiracy by definition. You know, just like the official government story is a conspiracy theory. Just as much as any other theory that says someone else did it. The official government story is a conspiracy theory, is it not? I agree entirely. I mean I mean you make the, the case right there, except for uh this conspiracy is at a much larger in depth level and it's been going on for a lot longer. Of course. And people, a lot of people get, when they look at a 9-11, they're like, oh, well, you know, who cares? It's te it happened 10 years ago. Well, it, it, everything in our lives today have changed because of what happened on September 11th, 2001. They justify wiretapping, you know, illegal wiretaps, monitoring your phone calls, your email, your text messages, and, you know, now they want to get into Skype and everything else. They justify that because the boogeyman might blow up another building or hijack another airplane from yeah. a cave with a laptop. Look out, James. He might be in your closet. I think I'm going to go hide under my bed. I'm scared. Please, please take away more of my rights and freedoms, government. <laughs> well, here's please my argument this, for that. The power. Please. Here's my <laughs> argument for that. You know, like, if they hate us for our freedoms and they attacked us for our freedoms, the terrorists have won. Because they've taken away all of our freedoms in response to the attacks because of our freedoms. 
So that means that all these guys should be dancing the Irish jig in a cave somewhere right now, and they should be happy. You know, we got the Americans to get rid of their rights. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, that's, that's, just, that's what's happened in 10 years. We got attacked, quote unquote, for our freedom, and we gave up said freedoms so that we wouldn't get attacked again. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, that, that's what people don't understand. I mean, I, I, this is what I try to, to, to hammer into people when it comes to the discussion regarding 9 11, because I realize there are people out there that don't want to believe that the government or shallow elements of government are, you know, the powers that be uh, carried out this operation. But just simply forget about 9 11 for a second and look what's, what's happened since 9 11. Like you were saying a moment ago, Popeye, the Department of Homeland Security. Patriot Act, these unconstitutional wars, the TSA, the groping at airports, all this stuff, it wouldn't have been allowed to happen if it wasn't for that, that sad day back on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. And they use bin Laden until they killed him on the Illuminati's birthday, May 1st, 1776, slash forward to, you know, May 1st, 2011, and they, you know, their little ritual, they do everything. Well, uh, you know, you remember to like two years ago, Bin Laden came out and made a tape and said that we don't, you know, we should care about global warming. I'm not kidding you. This was I I this that. was during the climate gate thing. Oh, you know, if you don't pass, you know, carbon taxes, Al Qaeda will attack. Really, really. So now Bin Laden is in the green movement. I mean, come on, people. It's it, he's like a poster boy for you know anything that goes wrong. They would blame it on the boogeyman, and now he's been drawn out. You know, too long. They they knew the narrative was getting old, so they throw away him and they come out with the new boogeyman, who's the American-born Al Qaeda. He's an American citizen, Mister Anwar. Or excuse me, you have the American-born Adam Gadan and the American citizen um, Anwar Al Awlaki. And so now it's American Al Qaeda. You have to be careful. Your neighbor could be in with Anwar Al Awlaki, James. Yeah, I mean, because that's, that's what they want. They want us to have this uh, witch hunt. They want us to be fearful of each other, just like during the time of the McCarthy era or, or the uh, Salem witch trials or uh, the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> uh, Popeye's my guest. His website, federaljack.com. And they, they are definitely shifting the uh, direction from the quote-unquote Muslim extremists towards another group of people. And we see that with what transpired last Friday in Norway. Oh, well, now they're trying to blame conservatives. And it's, mm -hmm. it's everything is conservatives, conservatives, conservatives. And it's funny how fast our media jumped on and said that it was al-Qaeda and everything else. And then now they're saying it's, con you know, oh, well, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. I guess the guy was a conservative, this, that. And a lot of people are attacking some of the media in the United States here for saying that it was uh, a Muslim. And they're saying, oh, see, it's, it's Islamophobia and all this other stuff. I think that there's something bigger behind that. I think that they were doing that on purpose to set up conservative, I'm doing air quotes, conservative networks like Fox News, you know, and say, look, they're, they're Muslim haters too. They're just like the violent guy in Norway because, remember, he was against Muslims. So now they can use this, this excuse that the American conservative media and conservatives try to blame the Muslims. Now they can be like, see, see, they're dangerous. They're worse than Al Qaeda. They have guns. Guns are bad. Guns, guns hurt people. I mean, that's what they're trying to get across. And let's get something straight. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. Pencils don't misspell words, and spoons don't make people fat. Okay? They are a tool. They are a piece of technology. It is not the technology's fault that bad things happen. It's the evil schmuck who picks up that tool or piece of technology and uses it for an evil purpose. Just like information. Information isn't evil or good. It just is. It's what you do with it that makes it good or evil. You're absolutely right, Popeye. And look at water is another prime example of something that's used for good, yet at the same time can be used for evil. We need water to survive, but at the same time, uh, you know, you have, you have plenty of these uh, mommies who have been, you know, put on so many medications in Prozac who go, you know, cuckoo and what happens they end up drowning their kids in the bathtub yeah so should we outlaw taking baths now because you might drown in the bathtub Ooh. or water water should be illegal because it kills people <laughs> it, well, it's, it's just ridiculous it's like I've, I've said before in my show it, it's the, the, the government can be uh, you know uh, 
a tool. It's like a hammer. It can be equated to a tool or a hammer. Okay, it's just the same thing. And if you look at it, government isn't evil or good. It just is. It's a tool. Now, what you do with it is what makes it evil or good. So if you use the government to persecute people and destroy people's rights and, you know, uh, just do, uh, you know, be a, uh, a dictator, well, then, yeah, then it's a bad government. But if government is used to, uh, you know, better people's lives, or ensure not really better people's lives, but the only thing the government's really supposed to do is ensure that people's rights aren't trampled on. That's really the only thing the government is supposed to do. The rest of the, rest of the things that we kind of give away to them we're supposed to do ourselves. But it's like a hammer. You could either build a house with a hammer or you could bash someone's skull in with it. It's not the hammer. It's what you do with it, you know? So it's the same thing with government, information, a gun. You know, I could kill you with a screwdriver. Does that mean we should ban screwdrivers? I mean, you're absolutely right about that, Popeye. And that's one thing that these people don't seem to understand. And it's just like in Norway, they had really tough gun laws and restrictions, yet that didn't stop this, this supposed lone gunman from killing 76 people on an island. And I, I mean, I find that whole story to be a farce. Anyways, it's hard to believe that one guy could go in all James Bond-like, uh, set off a bomb in Oslo, and then you know, make it across the, the lake or whatever this island is and kill all these people all by his lonesome. When the cops got to the island, they knew his name. Mm -hmm. And they just, he's running around for, quote-unquote, two hours just capping people mercilessly. The police show up, and he's like, oh, puts his gun down and gives up. Really? Really? I'm supposed to buy into this. <laughs> no. Right. How come the cops didn't storm the island and just shoot him? He'd already killed a l massive amount of people. Why would you come up? Why would you be like, get on the ground? We want, we need to take you in. I, I understand you want questions. People want answers and stuff like that. But seriously, the, in, in the United States, and I don't want to hear, well, this is Norway. It's different. They're trained anti-terror. They were doing training drills a couple of days before. So they, they're trained via the same tactics, you know, SWAT tile tactics, special weapons and, and stuff. It, it, it's just yeah. dumb to think that these guys wouldn't shoot. It's an active shooter. Come on. Yeah, I, I agree entirely, Popeye. I mean, there's a lot of uh, un you know, unanswered questions, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Popeye is my guest. His website, federaljack.com. You're listening to Freedom Files on American Freedom Radio. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to Freedom Files live on this Tuesday afternoon, July 26, 2011. James Burns hanging out with you this afternoon along with Popeye. He's my guest. His website, federaljack.com. He also does a great radio show down the rabbit hole over on Orion. And uh, going back into our discussion, we were talking about the shooter, uh, Anders Brevik, before the break, Popeye, and uh, how he was able to uh, you know, go across this island by himself, supposedly, killing 76 people, you know, a couple hours to his lonesome, and yet the police show up and they don't bother to take him out, even though, as you, as you mentioned a moment ago before the break, yeah, they have training. They, they know about these situations. They should have gone in. They should have blasted the guy away. But not only did they not do that, they also knew the guy's name. Yeah, they were like, hey, you know, stop, blah, 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 blah. Come on. Come on. Really? I mean, you guys are trained to kill at a moment's notice with something like that. That's all you guys do is train off. That, that's what these SWAT teams and stuff do. You know, they're special weapons teams and everything else, and you're going to tell me when you get the chance to do it, you don't do it? Right. Right. I don't think so. I, I, don't, I just don't buy it. I think that, I, I, I think that there was a second gunman. There, I, how does least. a guy walk around an island by himself capping people? You know, I, I said in my um, in my show on Sunday that this guy didn't have beta mags. In, a, in case people, the listeners don't know what a beta mag is, a beta mag is a, a magazine. They're usually round, okay, a, a, and it's usually either one big round drum or uh, you, you, the the betas are two little drums side by side, and they usually hold about a hundred rounds, sometimes one hundred and fifty rounds. You know, big. So you have a, a drum magazine with a hundred rounds. This guy didn't have that. He had like maybe. 15 at the most 45 round mags from what I could take a guess at, you know, uh, from what I could see. It's judging by what I could see in the pictures of him holding his rifle and everything else. But they, they didn't report that he was, uh, if he had 100 round mags, I'm willing to bet that they would definitely be telling everybody and their mother that he had them. Okay. They, they wouldn't be, uh, you know, they would be, that would be one of the 
the talking points. It always is when the, you know when there's a shooting. But it's the size of the capacity of the magazine. So this guy had maybe forty five round mags at the most. He had to reload. He had to take out the empty and put in a fresh mag. Now I don't care if he knows how to shoot. That's still going to take a, a couple seconds. Okay, and they said he wasn't rapidly just pop, 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 like crazy. They said he was walking around and just shooting out and, and shooting people and uh, just walking around capping people. So how does nobody tackle the guy while he's reloading? Yeah. How come nobody had a gun? You know how fast that would have been over if someone had a gun and they fired back? Then he would have had to crouch down and take a position. He wouldn't be running around the island freely capping kids. Then you maybe can come up on him, you keep some cover, you work your way up, and you blow his brains out. That's what happens when you own a gun. You can fight back. But nobody could fight back. They had to lay in the fetal position, and he would just walk up and shoot them. It doesn't yeah, make I mean, st- it's just appalling to me. Just yeah, appalling. you're right. It doesn't make sense, Pop. I mean, one that from my research, it looks like he probably had a Mini-14 and a Glock. And as we both know, I mean, they have serious you know, gun laws in Norway. It's a lot more difficult to get a gun there than here in the United States. And, I mean, they even say that this gun wasn't even an automatic gun. They say it was a semi-auto gun. And they say at the most that he probably might have had 30-round magazines. So that's how many 30-round magazines did he have to be carrying in order to kill that many people? That's what I'm saying. How many, how, come on. He had to reload at some point. You're going to tell me nobody has the testicular fortitude, an island with at least 100 people on it? No yeah. one person on that island has the testicular fortitude to charge the guy with a rock. Yeah, yeah, you might get taken out, but you'll save other people. Besides, the, who knows? He might freak out and drop his weapon if he sees someone coming at him. You don't know. But laying there and taking it, oh, I just that's what they want you to do. They want you to be a victim. And when I say they, I mean the the, the establishment, the elites. They want you to be a victim. And you know, even if this wasn't a false flag, even if this guy really was just off his rocker. OK, it's a perfect example of what not to do in a, in a situation like that. So here in the states, in certain states in, in the country, you know, I live in Florida and down here, everybody's packing heat. If this had happened down here, this would have gone extremely differently. It would have been completely different because people would have been firing back. You know, if you noticed, all these mass shootings always happen in a place where the people are unarmed or they can't defend themselves. And. It, the same is true for Fort Hood because on Fort Hood, the only people that are armed are the police. The soldiers don't walk around with rifles on bases here inside the country. Weapons are checked into the, the armory. And, you, you know, you, you, you can shoot when you're on the range or when you go out for training and stuff. But you don't just walk around with your weapon until you're getting ready to deploy. And then you get, you, you know, you, you get your, you, your weapon assigned to you and you deploy with it. And you come back, you bring it back with you. But you don't walk around the military – soldiers don't walk around military bases inside the United States with M16s and machine guns. So, yeah, they worked easy, easier targets because they weren't able to defend themselves. They had to wait for the base police to, have, to come with the guns. So, yeah, it's amazing. You never see, it go, you, you never see a, a, a gunman walk into an area where everybody's carrying guns, where everybody has concealed carry or open carry. You never see a gunman walk in there and try to shoot people, do you? No. Because it would be a firefight, and he would probably be on the losing end of it. So they exactly. always mysteriously happen in the weak links, James. And I just find that very suspicious. And I, I agree with you 100% there, Pop. I mean, it, it goes back to my, my theory about the way things should be. I mean, I don't think people should be forced to own guns. But if, if we took a, took a page out of what happened in the Cold War between the Soviets and the U.S. with mutually assured destruction, if, say, everybody inside the bank had a gun, the tellers, the bank manager, even you know, some of the customers, why, why would a potential robber want to go into that bank? Well, exactly. And that's, that's the way it is. Like, again, down here in Florida, you get a concealed – as long as you don't have a felony – you get a concealed weapons permit. This isn't a shall issue state. This is a will issue state. So, <clears throat> like we we will issue it to you if you don't have a felony, and that's the way it works. And all the time, you, there's stories down here in the local media all the time. Last year, some old guy. He was an old Marine veteran. He had a concealed weapons permit. He had a Glock on him in his waistband. And uh, these two guys came in. They robbed the Subway sandwich shop he was at. And they pushed him in. They were pushing him towards the bathroom in the back. 
they were going to rob him. And he, he, he was afraid for his life because he was like, you know, he's smart enough to know that these two young guys are going to take me to the bathroom. They're probably going to overpower me and try to kill me. So he, he played, you know, weak. He let them, you know, get some confidence. He backed up, backed up, backed up. And when he had enough space, he drew out his weapon and shot both of them point blank range. Boom, boom, in the head. End of problem. And he didn't go to jail. It was self-defense. The cops were like, yep. He was, you know, defending himself. That's the way it is. Boom. Done. That's the way the laws are down here. And, yeah, you'll always – sometimes you can get a prosecutor that, you know, goes too far, like a local prosecutor or whatever. But the laws in Florida are that you can defend yourself. It's the only good thing Jeb Bush did, you know, before he left was they – he changed the laws so it was a little easier to defend yourself down here. Someone breaks into your house, you don't even have to give them a warning. You can just shoot them dead. And I'm not saying that that's what people, you know, should do to everybody. But I'm saying – we yeah. have the right to protect ourselves. And I'm not saying that we, people should go around killing each other or anything. Look, I'm for peace, love, and harmony. But if you break into my house, I'm going to guess that you're not coming in to have coffee and tea with me. <laughs> and considering what I do, if you're breaking into my house, I'm going to assume that you're some stooge coming to do harm to my family. And I, I'm not going to I'm not going to allow that to happen. And that's the way it should be. That, that's why the Founding Fathers gave us the Second Amendment. It was to ensure that we had the First Amendment. You know, it was, it was to protect ourselves against others, you know, being able to protect myself from someone breaking in or whatever. But it was also to protect the freedom of speech. You know, I, I, when I was a kid, my father used to tell me the reason why they gave us the Second Amendment was to protect the First. Yeah. Otherwise, without it, you, the other uh, ten, the first ten amendments really don't mean – or the other nine amendments really don't mean anything, do they? They don't. And <laughs> – and your father was absolutely right, and that's one reason why you do what you do and what I do what I do. We choose to use the First Amendment as our weapon right now because we, we want things to be resolved and, and done peacefully. We want a peaceful restoration of our rights and freedoms and liberties. And when it comes to gun ownership and your right to defend yourself, whether it's in your home or in your person or in your car, I mean, that, that does tie into individual responsibility, and that's one of the huge problems that I see that we have not only in this country but throughout the entire world, people no longer take responsibility for themselves. It's just like back on this island of Utoya. I think there's, what, maybe 600 people on this island, and none of them, like you said a moment ago, none of them bothered to grab a rock and even try to stop him. Why? Well, see, pers- that's the, I, I harp on that my, myself a lot. Nobody has personable, or I'm probably saying that wrong, personal accountability. It, it's like... Nowadays, when kids do something bad, I didn't do it. it. wasn't me. wasn't me. I didn't do it. it. wasn't me. You know, I did that too a couple of times when I was a kid, but I got my rear end handed to me anyway because my mother could see through it. She knew. And I was, I, I was raised old school. My parents were born in the 40s. My father grew up at the, uh, you know, during the end of World War II. My mother was born right at the very end of World War II in Europe. So I, I had, a, I guess, a different I, – maybe I'm a little more old school than some people. But it, I was just raised differently. You see these kids nowadays, and a lot of it has to do with the schooling, like Charlotte Iserby has talked about in her book, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. You know, they, they, they mind you know, rape these children in these schools, and they brainwash them, and they get them to think that black is white, up is down, and your parents are bad. You know better than your parents. Look at the climate change stuff. That's a perfect example. They tell kids to go home and rat on your parents for leaving lights on. And, you know, you should write your parents. Some schools gave their kids tickets to to give the, you know, to write to the parents. And just last week I I was reading a story. Uh, The kids were getting told uh, in a D.A.R.E. program, hey, if you see your parents with marijuana, you should, you know, call the police. We'll give you uh, uh, a video game system. I think it was a PlayStation, uh, PlayStation 3. And the, these two kids, they were they went home, and they I guess their parents smoked pot, and they went and ratted their parents out, and they didn't even have like an eighth of marijuana in the house, okay? Which is in most anywhere in the country, you know, uh, most people don't realize this, but an eighth of marijuana is a misdemeanor. Most places, anything less than an ounce is a misdemeanor, and the the schools via the government or excuse me, the government via the schools are teaching these kids to rat their parents out. Oh, my God, they've got an eighth of marijuana. And they came in and SWAT team the house, and they arrested the guys, the, the mother and father, and now they took the two kids away. They got their PlayStation from the police, but now they're in CPS custody. 
So what a trade off that is. I, I, but so I got my PlayStation 3, but I could never play it because I'm too busy getting raped by pedophiles at CPS. That's just lovely. Yeah, and, that, and that's definitely part of the problem, Popeye, is you have this government who we, we set aside for so long, not just us, but generations before us, and allowed the government to continue to expand its power and authority and continue to you know, suck us dry and justify its existence with new departments and agencies and causes like the war on terror, like the uh, war on drugs, when in the end, all that should be individual responsibility. Of course. Look, I've said this plenty of times before, and I, I've, I've even proven it. When I used to run a tattoo shop down in uh, South Beach, right, we would have we, – we were in a pretty you know, rough area. <clears throat> and there was always drunks and crackheads and bums and stabbings and shootings. And it was just this, this one section where, where the tattoo shop was. It was like this, it just – that's the kind of energy it drew to it. And we would call the cops for stuff. And they would show up 45 minutes later to an hour later if they showed up at all. And when they did show up, if they showed up, they would tell us, you guys shouldn't wait for us because, you know, we're, we, we usually – they would flat out tell us when we hear a call come in for a fight or whatever, we usually let it we, – we wait 10 or 15 minutes before we respond because we don't want to have to deal with it. We want them to, like, you know, beat the crap out of each other and then we come clean it up. That's, th this is coming from two cops in a squad car responding to a call. Okay, that was on our street, and I was talking to them about it. This is exactly from the horse's mouth. So we just stopped calling the cops. When there was a problem, we handled it ourselves because we there was an alleyway right next to our tattoo shop. So we used to literally, we would fist fight people right in front of the shop or drag them out to the alleyway and kick the crap out of them. No lie. And that would, we handled our own business. Usually somebody else would call the cops, and by the time the cops showed up, the pro, we were already done. The guy was on the sidewalk, knocked out, or they were in the alleyway, or they had walked off already. The problem was already over. I mean, that's really how things would go down. The cops literally told us, you have to handle things yourself because, you know, we're, they didn't even want to come out. So it wasn't even a matter of we can't come out, which now, with all these economic and budget cuts, is becoming a reality that there are no police because they're firing half of them or they're telling them not to respond to certain crimes. But at the time, they were just – openly admitting they don't want to deal with it. That's their job, and they don't want to deal with it. You know how many cops are cops not to enforce the law? They're just cops because they needed a steady job? Well, too many of them, unfortunately, and they have more important things to do, as you and I know, like arrest people for filming them and uh, setting up these uh, safety seatbelt checkpoints. Because that's more important, because revenue generating is more important than actually you know, serving the community. When I was a kid, they used to say to protect and serve on the police cars. It doesn't say that anymore. No, it doesn't. We used to ask who are you serving and protecting anyway because it's certainly not us. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, cops were different when I was a kid. I'm old enough to remember that I, I'm in my mid-30s, and I'm old enough to remember the cops when I was a kid that I grew up around were these older guys that had been on the, you know, on the police force since, the, the, you know, the 60s, you know, late 60s, early 70s. And these guys were, you know, they were the older school generation of cops. And you could tell the older cops – there are some bad cops that are older, but I've noticed that a, a lot of the cops out there that are good are the older school cops. They're not these younger generation ones that, you know, you get a kid that's 21 years old. Uh, yeah. I'm in my mid 30s. This kid was, this kid could have been, I was, I, I was 15 when uh, half hold of that these thought, cops Popeye, that we got, we got to go to break. Uh, Popeye's my guest. His website, federaljack.com. More of him right after this. You're listening to Freedom Files on AFR. to the final segment this afternoon. You're listening to Freedom Files live on this Tuesday, July 26, 2011. I am James Burns, joined once again by Popeye over at federaljack.com. He also does a radio show, Down the Rabbit Hole, which you can check out at Orion. And before the break, Popeye, we were talking about uh, how police have changed in this country, and you're absolutely right about that. I mean, they've, they've gone from being uh, a lot more about serving and protecting to more about goose stepping and re revenue collecting. Well, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, and the New Jersey State Police, which I I applied to work for, and I got accepted. They they have a, a a vetting process. They actually sit down and they have you come down for an interview and everything. And uh, uh, 
another friend of mine that had gone with me actually didn't make it. And he was a retired Marine. So, you know, they, it, it's it, their recruiting process is kind of like the military. And about halfway through it, I just couldn't do it because I was like, wow, I don't I don't want to be part of this. You guys are you know, I want to like help citizens. But you guys are walking around and, you know, you look like you're, you're getting dressed, look like you're ready to invade Poland. I mean, look at you ever see the New Jersey State Police uniforms? They're very Nazi esque, and hey, look at them. They have long, high, you know, the knee high motorcycle like boots. You know the the pants, the way the the uniform sits. They 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 wear a leather sash. You know, like a, a, a almost like a uh, kind of like a, a holster or harness type thing. If I remember, it's been a couple of years since I saw the uniform, but they wear you know in Boston. Same thing. Boston State Police, their uniforms look very similar to the New Jersey State Police uniforms. And when you see these guys in their uniforms step out of their car, it's like, wow, you know, am I in, am I in uh, 1933 Germany? Where, where are we? That's what you feel like, and that's what you're supposed to feel like. You know, if you notice, did you notice after 9-11 that all these police departments across the country stopped with their multicolored cars and they went back to the old black and whites? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of them that did that. I mean, I mean that's interesting you bring that up because we st we still technically have uh, Shreveport police here. They have the the white cars with uh, patriotic red and blue. But this was something I wanted to talk to you about last night. We were chatting online. I never really got a chance to bring it up. I was busy doing other things. But I don't know if you heard about this, but not only do we have the regular Shreveport Police Department, there's also kind of a branch of the Shreveport Police Department. They drive around in black squad cars. Uh, kind of like in a wolf pack, two or three cars, you know, racing down the road together. Uh, they have yellow riding on the side of their vehicles called the CRU, the Community Response Unit. And from my own sources within the police department, I, I was told that th that this is federally funded. Well, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. They're trying to. They want to control everything. These people are control freaks. I mean, they, they, they rightly believe that the American public can't do things on their own, which right now we can't. And you know why we can't? Because we refuse to take responsibility, like we said earlier. If we all get over our own egos, get over ourselves. You know, to the listeners, get over yourself. Either you're part of something much bigger. This world isn't about you. It's not about your family. It's not about your friends. It's not about your success or how much money you have. There's, we're all part of something bigger, and as soon as everybody realizes that, and I'm, don't get me wrong, this isn't New Age speak, and this isn't communist speak, I'm not a socialist <laughs> or anything like that, but we're all human beings, and it, it, as soon as we understand a, a, and we grow up and we start to accept things and take responsibility, you know, look, I don't need the government to protect me. The police aren't going to protect you. I've already explained that. You know, the cops aren't there to protect you. They're there to you know, get revenue for whatever, whoever they work for, city, state, or county. And they're there to investigate crimes after the fact. But they really don't prevent crimes from happening, okay? It, it, there's no way cops can do that. There's just, it, it, that's, anybody with half a brain knows that, okay? So they're, they're not going to prevent crime. You know what prevents crime? A self-empowered individual. Because you're less likely to get screwed with if you walk down the street and you know you can handle yourself. You give off that aura. People will shy away from even screwing with you because they'll they'll sense, wow, this this person this person can take care of themselves. They don't want to, you know, you if you put off that energy, people are going to pick it up. We receive and 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 give energy back and forth. We're transmitters, receivers. So people are going to, you know, when oh, I get the vibes from this person, we'll give off the vibes that you can handle yourself and that you're not going to take any crap and that you will defend yourself and I guarantee you you will have less problems when it comes to things like that because people that pull stuff off like this they look for when you know like a serial killer okay i i as a as a side hobby i've studied serial killers for many many years and uh, i've read you know manifestos different things one of the best books you can ever read it's a really disturbing book it's called lust mord <clears throat> lust mord the writings and uh the writings and notes or something like that of serial killers. It's really – it's it, and this – the stuff that some of these writings are in there from these people that go back you know, 100 years ago or whatever. And I would tell you what. It's really creepy because when you listen to how they, these serial killers talk and you listen to how these globalists talk, they're very much on the same level. Okay, But serial killers, they'll tell you they don't 
just go out. It's sometimes some of them randomly pick people, but a lot of times they hunt their prey and they try, you know, you'll, a lot of them have said, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, they'll admit because of their stature or whatever, they would hunt people and purposely pick victims that they knew they could overpower. So if you give off that aura that you're a weak individual, you're going to attract somebody trying to kick your butt. It's just the way it is. But if you give off that aura that says, I'm not going to take it, if that person mistakenly comes over and tries it, you stand your ground. And then, you know, I'm not promising a utopian society, but things will go much better in your life if you're willing to stand up and you give off that aura that you can handle yourself and you're not going to take any crap. Things go very differently. You'd be surprised how everyday interactions with people are different because right off the bat, a lot of people realize that you're not someone to be trifled with. You know, you're not, and I'm not saying that you have to walk around, you know, with a bandana, sunglasses on, <laughs> tattoos all over yourself with a bat in your hands. Just it, it's how you hold yourself. You know, it all starts inside you. If you're willing to defend yourself, defend your property, and stand up for what's right, you're going to emanate that, and that's going to attract and you know like-minded people. Plus, it's going to reach out into other parts of your life and affect it in a positive way, just as much as if you walked around saying, "I'm a loser. I can't defend myself. I'm a victim. I'm going to get attacked. You know, the boogeyman is going to get me. Osama bin Laden is going to jump out of my closet and and, and you know hijack me and fly me into a building." I mean, that's that's <laughs> seriously. I know, I know it's kind of funny, but It's that's the way it is. If you think if we they want us to think like that, they want us to be in that fear mindset so that they can control us, because if we use the opposite, which is love, you know, you have knowledge and power with love and you think clearly and you, you know, you you sit down and you you take things in and you think about it. Whereas on the fear vibe, you're just very, oh, my God, oh, my God, don't hurt me. You know, take away whatever. Just protect me. Save me. You know, you're not making any rational thoughts. How many times have people said, oh, I made the the dumbest decision because I was afraid at the time. But if I think back now, I wouldn't have made the same decision. Of course not. You know, Dr. Bruce Lipton really talks about this stuff. He's a a good individual to look up. He he scientifically explains it better than I could. He's very more eloquent about it. But, you know, for the people that in case the listeners that are out there, you know, are a little, you know, what is Popeye talking about? Go check out Dr. Bruce Lipton and you'll see what I'm talking about. That's why there's always, you know, fear perpetrated in the media. That's why there's always, ooh, be afraid, the boogeyman or right-wing extremists or whoever or aliens or you know ghosts or ooh, you know, be afraid because they need that fear. They feed off that. It's easier to control us. If we all just said no, you know, like Neo in the end of the Matrix, he puts his hand up and they, sh- they shoot the bullets at him and he says no. And he just puts his hand up and he realizes what the Matrix is and he sees everything. That's what we need to do. We need to realize our own power. We need to stand up and say no. And that's where it starts. And then things will branch off from there. That's the only way we're going to fix this mess. Otherwise, we're headed for a total, uh, I can't say the word, totalitarian Totalitarian. police state. Yeah. It's a tongue twister. I know. You're right. I mean, we're going to go in one or two directions if we don't try and resolve this peacefully. Either we're going to head in that direction where we're going to have nothing but full-fledged tyranny that's going to make Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union look like a cakewalk. Or we're going to end up having a, a violent, bloody revolution in this country, and that's going to be just as bad, in my opinion. Yeah, see, we need a restoration of the Constitution and our, and our civil liberties and our civil rights and clear thinking and free thought and, and love. Just the, the vibrational frequency of love. And I don't mean running around like hippies, but we, we yeah. have, the, the world, the universe runs on two frequencies, love and fear. Even, even mainstream science has admitted this. You know, if you start to look up into quantum physics and anybody that's ever looked into quantum physics will understand what I'm talking about. Atoms are hollow. Science has admitted that even the desk that you're sitting at, you know, the desk I'm sitting at, the chair I'm sitting in, it's it's made up of atoms that are actually hollow. So what makes up the atoms? Well, thought makes up that. So, you know, and this gets into the esoteric stuff. And this is the stuff they don't want us to know. This is part of the hidden knowledge that they keep from us. And that's how they can control us. It's not that they're better than us. They just have more knowledge than we do about yeah. certain things, and they use that to their advantage. It's like if you knew tomorrow the, you know, tomorrow's winning lottery numbers, would you not go buy a ticket with those winning lottery numbers on it? <laughs> yeah. you, have a good, you have a very good point there, Popeye, and we're just about out of time, so we're going to have you back up on the show to talk more about uh, this stuff and as well as the uh, programming aspects of movies, TV shows, and video games. But in the final seconds we have left, uh, fire off the website and your radio show. All right, cool. Uh, you guys can check out my website, federaljack.com, 
And uh, I do a radio show three days a week, Wednesday nights from 10 to 11, Friday nights from 10 to 11, uh, and Sundays from 5 to 7 p.m., all Eastern Standard Time on the Orion Talk Radio Network. And you can find it at oriontalkradio.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Pop Pile. I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me, James. I appreciate it.